Welcome to our live webcast, Back to Basics, Ultrasound Guided Regional Anesthesia for the Upper Extremity and the Role of X-Ray Imaging. Thank you for joining us. My name is Heidi Border and I'm Senior Meeting Planner for ASRA and will be the host for tonight's webinar. We are joined tonight by our moderator, Dr. Maggie Holtz of the Wellstar Kennestone Regional Medical Center in Marietta, Georgia, who is going to introduce tonight's topic and speakers. Welcome, Dr. Holtz. Thank you, Heidi. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. We truly appreciate you taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us this evening, and we sincerely hope that you will find this webinar both educational and enjoyable, too. It is indisputably a thrilling time for regional anesthesia. Novel blocks, particularly those of the fascial plane block variety, are described in what seems like a daily basis. It's exciting and it grabs our attention. We wanna try these blocks, perfect these blocks, tweet out these blocks, and re even rename these blocks. They are all the rage on the podium, at conferences and in workshops, and in social media dialogue as well. Despite the fanfare, however, sometimes these blocks don't live up to their hype. And so we thought we'd switch gears a bit and dedicate this evening to some tried and true brachial plexus blocks. Yep, we're going back to the basics, revisiting blocks that have been around for the better part of a half of a century. But we also intend to freshen it up a bit uh, by introducing some tips, tricks, and pearls along the way. I am very pleased to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Kendra Bass. Dr. Bass is a regional anesthesiologist in private practice with American Anesthesiology of North Carolina in Raleigh. She is board certified by the American Board of Anesthesiology and completed her regional fellowship at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. She is a member of the American Society of Anesthesiologists and has served two terms on ASA's Regional Anesthesiology and Acute Pain Medicine Committee. Dr. Bass has practiced in academics as well as private practice and has a passion for teaching regional anesthesia. Following Dr. Bass's presentation, we will have a Q&A session. So if you have questions along the way, please utilize the Q&A box um, in the bottom of your screen. We will try to get to as many questions as we can. If time does not permit, Dr. Bass and I will also be sharing our Twitter handles. So feel free to message us with any additional outstanding questions we really want you to get out of this webinar what you came here tonight for. All right, let's do this. So without further ado, I welcome Dr. Bass. Thanks, Heidi. All right, and thank you, Dr. Holtz. Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar. Back to Basics, Ultrasound Guided Regional Anesthesia for the Upper Extremity and the Role of X-ray Imaging. I would first like to thank both ASRA and Payant for giving me the opportunity to speak with you all this evening. I am sure we have a breadth of anesthesia providers listening in this evening, and I hope that each of you find something that you can take back to your regional anesthesia practice tomorrow. As for me, I am currently in a large private practice group that covers several community hospitals and ambulatory surgery centers. Being well-versed in the practice of upper extremity nerve blocks is imperative whether one has subspecialty training or not. I know across the country, we have experienced a plethora of what I like to call COVID-related fractures as people have spent the last year at home enjoying various outdoor extracurricular activities, many of those activities on two wheels, between bicycles, scooters, skateboards, and my all-time favorite, the hoverboard, we have seen an uptick of fractures to the upper extremity. Tonight, we will spend the evening reviewing the basic upper extremity nerve blocks, focusing on the interscaling and supraclavicular blocks. We will start our evening discussing the interscaling nerve block, proper block technique, mechanisms of nerve injury and how best to avoid them, typical local anesthetic volume and the effects of a low volume technique. We will then review the decision-making process when it comes to blocking clavicle fractures, proper block selection for clavicle fractures, 
what you should look for on x-ray imaging and the risk and benefits of blocking clavicle fractures. We will finish the evening with the tried and true and what I like to call the spinal of the arm as we discuss the supraclavicular nerve block, proper block technique and nerve injury prevention. Lastly, we will review the decision-making process when it comes to blocking humerus fractures, how x-ray imaging can help with that decision and the risk associated with specific types of humerus fractures. So let's get started with the indications for an interscaling nerve block. The interscaling approach results in reliable anesthesia of the shoulder and the upper arm. The inferior trunk C8 to T1 is usually spared unless larger volumes of local anesthetic in the range of 20 to 30 milliliters are used. C8 to T1 also results in blockade when block placement is between the interscaling block and supraclavicular block. This block is done via ultrasound guidance and in-plane technique and with the final transducer location at approximately three to four centimeters superior to the clavicle. The goal is to have local anesthetics spread around the superior and middle trunks between the anterior and middle scaling muscles. In my practice, this block is typically done with 0.5% row pivocaine or occasionally we'll use a bupivacaine at a dose of about 20 to 30 mLs. For patients where there is concern for respiratory compromise, a lower dose can be used as an attempt to reduce phrenic nerve blockade, which we will touch on in just a few minutes. But keep in mind that the duration of the nerve block will be sacrificed at those lower volumes. So over the next several minutes, we will take a deeper dive into the interscaling block technique. In order to perform the interscaling nerve block, the patient is typically placed in a beach chair position facing away from the operative side. Asking the patient to reach for the ipsilateral knee will depress the clavicle slightly and allow better access to the structures of the anterior lateral neck. I usually place a rolled up blanket or pillow longitudinally behind the patient's back in order to elevate the upper chest off the stretcher, which gives me better exposure to the neck, but also more room to insert my needle without bumping into the stretcher. Color Doppler is an important ultrasound feature to utilize in order to identify and avoid any vascular structures. The technique that I typically utilize is called the trace back method, which entails starting at the level of the clavicle, lateral to the carotid artery and inter internal jugular vein, scanning cephalad and medially until the brachial plexus comes into view in between the scaling muscles. As you can see in the photograph, the needle is inserted in plane with a lateral to medial approach. This approach allows you to visualize the entire shaft of the needle as well as the needle tip. Using ultrasound to visualize fractionated injections of local anesthetic allows for a reduction in the volume of local anesthetic required to accomplish this nerve block. The supraclavicular branches of the cervical plexus, which supply the skin over the acromion and clavicle, are usually blocked as well due to the proximal and superficial spread of local anesthetic. Anytime we are placing ultrasound guided nerve blocks, preventing nerve injury should be a priority. With the in-plane approach, you should be able to visualize the entire shaft of the needle as well as the needle tip. The current needles on the market are highly echogenic and easily visible for upper extremity nerve blocks. With these first rate needles, the needle should be visible throughout the entire duration of the block. Lateral to medial insertion of the needle is safest to avoid puncture or passage through any vascular structures, but also to avoid transecting the phrenic nerve. 
safe injection technique prioritizes intraneural injection. In my personal practice, I tend to inject the local anesthetic alongside the roots in the, in, in the interscaling groove um, as depicted in the top photograph. So as you can see, the needle is coming in alongside the brachial plexus. Um, I typically do not place my needle between the nerve roots in an effort to avoid penetration of those nerve roots with the needle. The reason being, as you can see from the bottom picture, is that the C6 and C7 nerve, um, nerve roots often split proximally. Instead of having the prototypical three-part stoplight view, oftentimes you will have a view that appears to have five or six quote-unquote stoplights. With this anatomical situation occurs, an option is to either inject between C5 and C6, above C5 or deep to C6. Never inject against high resistance. Such resistance may indicate needle nerve contact or intrafascicular injection. If your practice measures injection pressures during peripheral nerve blockade, a high opening injection pressure, which is considered greater than 15 PSI is always present with needle to nerve root contact. Nerve stimulator and quantitative measurement of injection pressures are techniques that can be used in addition to ultrasound as an effort to reduce the likelihood of nerve injury. So as I mentioned earlier um, in the presentation, using multiple small aliquots, i.e. fractionated injections of local anesthetic allows for a reduction in the volume of local anesthetic required to accomplish this nerve block. A total of 20 to 30 milliliters of 0.5% row pivocaine or bupivacaine is typically used in order to achieve surgical anesthesia and or a prolonged analgesic effect. Several studies have shown that lower volumes of local anesthetic in the range of seven to 15 mLs is usually adequate for a successful and rapid onset of blockade. Even smaller volumes may be effective. The total volume used should depend on the visual, like, visualization of the spread, the weight comorbidities of the patient, as well as the practitioner's experience and comfort level. However, in regards to lower volumes, it has been shown that doses in the range of five to 10 milliliters do result in hemidiaphragmatic palsy approximately 25 to 60% of the time, instead of the 99% of the time that you can see at higher volumes. But with that said, there is never a dose that will reliably prevent phrenic nerve blockade at the interscaling level. Therefore, particular attention should be paid to the patient's comorbidities especially respiratory, prior to an interscaling nerve block at any dose. So let's take a closer look at the effects of a low volume interscaling nerve block. So numerous studies have been done looking at the lowest effective dose of local anesthetic for analgesia, surgical anesthesia, as well as to minimize phrenic nerve block A. I would like to highlight this particular article, which looked at the minimum effective volume of 0.5% row pivocaine in 90% of patients, or MEV90. I chose this study because 0.5% row pivocaine is what I currently use in my own practice. A seven milliliter starting dose was used with patients receiving a higher or lower dose depending on the previous patient's response. The MEV90 of 0.5% row pivocaine for interscaling block in this particular study was determined to be 8.64 milliliters. Time for onset of sensory block was five minutes and onset of motor block was 10 minutes. Of note is that the duration of analgesia was only 8.2 hours. Therefore, it is important to keep in mind 
that if your goal is not only surgical anesthesia, but also post-operative pain control, using a lower volume of local anesthetic might not be advisable, especially in your ASA 1 and 2 patients. So let's look at how we can apply this nerve block, especially to our clavicle fracture patients. The inner scaling block can be used for surgical anesthesia and or post-operative pain control for clavicle fracture surgery. Regardless of the location of the fracture, a superficial cervical plexus block is needed if the goal is for complete coverage for surgical anesthesia. The superficial cervical plexus block provides analgesia for the medial one third of the clavicle. This can be accomplished with a field block along the posterior border of the sternocleidomastoid muscle. As seen in the top picture, the presence of edema or distorted anatomy can result in subpar ultrasound imaging, making nerve blockade even more challenging. Depending on your goals for the patient, it is helpful to look at the patient's x-ray images before deciding whether to block a clavicle fracture and which block or blocks would be the most beneficial. The supraclavicular nerves are susceptible to nerve damage at the time of injury, as well as during surgical fixation. We will touch on that in more depth over the next several slides. This featured study looked at interscaling brachial plexus block for surgical repair of middle and lateral clavicle fractures. The conclusion was that patients had significantly lower morphine consumption postoperatively versus controls at two postoperative hours. In my opinion, studies like these show the benefit of an interscaling block from a postoperative pain control perspective even if you would not consider a block for surgical anesthesia. In the current era where we are dealing with hospital bed shortages, the need to discharge patients more quickly and to perform more outpatient surgeries, improved pain in the PACU is an outcome that is very clinically significant. So for surgical anesthesia of the clavicle, it is wise to perform a superficial cervical plexus block in addition to your inner scaling block. Superficial cervical plexus blocks can be done with or without ultrasound guidance. To be honest, most of the time I utilize the landmark technique, but I also tend to do the majority of my clavicle fractures under general endotracheal anesthesia, usually per surgeon request. I will, however, review the ultrasound method as it is a much more precise technique. So when I do use ultrasound, I place the transducer transversely on the upper neck, overlying the sternocleidomastoid muscle at its midpoint. So once the sternocleidomastoid muscle has been identified, the transducer is moved posteriorly until the tapering posterior edge of the SCM is positioned in the middle of the screen. At this point, an attempt should be made to identify the brachial plexus and or the interscaling groove between the anterior and middle scaling muscles. The cervical plexus is usually visible as a small collection of hypoechoic nodules immediately superficial to the pre-vertebral fascia that overlies the inner scaling groove. The goal of this nerve block is to place the needle tip in the fascial layer underneath the SEM adjacent to the cervical plexus. So if the elements of the cervical plexus are not easily visualized, as you can see, those are very small <laughs> hypoechoic structures. The local anesthetic can be deposited in the plane immediately deep to the sternocleidomastoid muscle. A volume of five to 10 milliliters of local anesthetic usually suffices. <laughs> 
So to understand the risk and benefits of blocking clavicle fractures, it is important to understand the innervation. So the innervation of the clavicle is surprisingly complex as it has dual innervation from both the cervical plexus and the brachial plexus. The cervical plexus and its contributions from the supraclavicular nerves and the lateral pectoral nerve cover the acromioclavicular joint, the skin overlying the clavicle, the clavicle itself, and the sternoclavicular joint. The contribution from the brachial plexus, the nerve to the subclavius muscle, and the suprascapular nerve cover the clavicle ex itself and the acromioclavicular joint. So you can see the supraclavicular nerves are at risk for nerve damage at the time of injury, but also at the time of surgical fixation. So in order to have full anesthesia of the clavicle, they must be blocked with a cervical plexus block. Hence, it is important to look at x-ray imaging to determine which blocks will be needed for post-operative pain versus surgical anesthesia. So as we mentioned, as COVID hit and people ventured outdoors, we saw an increase in the number of upper extremity fractures, especially clavicle fractures. The clavicle bone is a common site of injury due to its superficial location. It's thin mid shaft and the forces across it, as you can see from the diagram on the upper right. So in that diagram, you see that the clavicle has the weight of the arm pulling downward, the trapezius and sternocleidomastoid muscles pulling upward, and the pectoralis muscle pulling transversely. So of the three types of clavicle fracture, the mid shaft is the most common type of fracture and also the most likely to be an operative fracture. Proximal fractures are more likely to be non-displaced, and if that's the case, treatment tends to be non-operative. So from the bottom left picture, you can see that the patients who experience fractures of the lateral two-thirds of their clavicle would benefit from the use of an interscaling block for post-operative pain control. But they would also need a cervical plexus block if the plan is to use regional anesthesia for surgical anesthesia. Because clavicle fractures commonly occur as a result of a trauma or a fall in the elderly, there tends to also be associated injuries such as scapula and rib fractures and or a pneumothorax. So on the bottom right um, radiograph presented, that shows a concomitant pneumothorax along with the clavicle fracture. This is a great example of how x-ray imaging gives vital information in the clinical decision-making of clavicle fractures patients prior to implementing regional anesthesia. So now we will take a closer look at the radiographic examples of the three types of clavicle fractures that we've been discussing. So on the right is the least common type the proximal clavicle fracture. And to an untrained eye, one might not even be able to identify that there is a fracture there. It can be very challenging um, due to the mechanism of displacement of those types of fractures uh, tend to be posterior. Oftentimes this type of fracture is more easily seen on a CT scan. But also remember that these types of fractures are rarely displaced and are usually non-operative. So on the upper left, you will see x-ray imaging of a distal clavicle fracture. Its location makes it amenable for regional anesthesia with an interscaling block for post-operative pain control. And then on the bottom left is an x-ray image of the most common type of fracture, which is the mid-shaft fracture. As you can see, this fracture is oftentimes displaced and requires operative fixation. Although it is possible to treat mid-shaft fractures with non-operative modalities, the decision is often made to proceed to the OR in order to restore normal anatomy more quickly. Also to achieve better pain control, 
and to return athletes to play sooner. So um, we will now just take a few moments to address one or two questions regarding interscaling blocks or clavicle fractures. Um, and then if we don't have any, we will move on to the supraclavicular nerve block. So Dr. Holtz, do we have any questions on um, clavicle fractures or interscaling? Yeah, so a couple, uh, Dr. Bass. So one of the expected side effects that you discussed, even with that low local anesthetic volume of the interscaling block is the accompanying phrenic nerve block. So how do you determine, you mentioned you know, patients having pulmonary issues. But it, more specifically, how do you determine who is, and more importantly, who isn't a candidate for this block? And what is your backup regional plan uh, for shoulder surgery if they actually cannot receive an interscaling block? Awesome, thank you. So um, I tend to really get a good clinical history of the patient. So if a patient has a diagnosis of COPD, um, like regular rescue inhaler use, um, any use of supplemental um, oxygen, I kind of take pause and really reassess that patient. Ideally, we would have PFTs on every patient, but that just isn't realistic. And so if I deem a patient not a great candidate due to their respiratory um, comorbidities, for arm surgery, I do an infraclavicular block. And for shoulder surgery, I actually tend towards just using PO multimodal pain meds like Celebrex, Gabapentin, um, Tylenol, um, and then local infiltration uh, by the surgeon. I know there are some other blocks that are out there and maybe you can speak on quickly like suprascapular nerve block, but currently um, in my practice, I'm not utilizing that type of block for shoulders. Great. Think? And yeah, and I think that, you know, there's more than one way to skin a cat. And, and like you, I look for things like oxygen dependency, recent flares. Um, I really pay attention to that restrictive lung disease. I think that those are the patients who tend to really need that extra pull of that hemidiaphragm. So, you know, your morbidly obese patients with OSA, you know, on HOMO2, that's, that's a, a no-brainer, no-go uh, for me. And I think that, you know, there are some plan B blocks. Uh, one is using simply oral multimodal therapy. Um, another is having the surgeons infiltrate. Um, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, another thing that we've been doing more often is these sort of plan B blocks. So the suprascapular and the axillary nerve blocks. Since we're aiming to get essentially C5 and C6 for shoulder surgery coverage, um, these blocks are a little bit distal to the clavicle, therefore you completely spare the phrenic and you get about 90% of the coverage that you would get from doing an interscaling block. So you can, you, you get a decent amount of benefit with very little to no risk, and especially no risk of that phrenic knockout. Um, and what we see in clinical practice, you know, in the literature, it seems like these blocks, uh, the interscaling block is certainly better earlier on as far as, you know, pain control and opioid consumption, but it seems to even out and a patient satisfaction is pretty, pretty good with, with that plan B block. Um, and we do these more often than not these days. If I, if there's a question um, on whether or not a patient's going to fly, in this day of COVID, when our hospitals are full and I don't have an option, I have they've got to go home. If there's even a question, I will choose one of those, those plan B blocks. But I think it just goes to show you that um, there are, you know, multiple options at, um, that, you know, if, if you can't, uh, if you have a patient who cannot tolerate the phrenic nerve knockout. So um, thank you. And then I think along similar lines, Dr. Bass, we, you know, we're now seeing a, a number of COVID positive patients or COVID long haulers present to surgery. And do you feel that regional anesthesia is with brachial plexus blocks is beneficial to them? Or do you feel like it's risky? Or does it sort of depend on their active pulmonary status? Yeah, so for most of our um, asymptomatic or mildly symptomatic uh, COVID patients, I tend to really push forward with regional anesthesia depending on their comorbidities prior to COVID, patient positioning and that sort of thing. Um, if they're not on supplemental O2 um, and the patient is COVID positive, I would still consider them um, a regional anesthetic, um, anesthetic candidate. The main reason is because 
I do not want to have to emergently instrument their airway. So as we all know, there is a very um, pointed donning and doffing of uh, PPE in regards to doing these cases. And so I don't want to get into a situation where I'm needing to emergently secure someone's airway. So if they're COVID positive and are having any sort of respiratory compromise, um, we tend to proceed with general anesthesia. And then real quickly, before we move on, I think um, we had a question from an uh, emergency medicine resident that um, looks good. Yes. Um, asking about the, you know, we, we talk in anesthesia about using these blocks for, uh, you know, acute pain management surgically, um, sort of perioperatively. And his question is about the utility of these interscaling brachial plexus blocks for patients with non-operative clavicle fractures with severe pain who are trying to go home from the ER. Yeah, so Daniel, that's a great question. And if you've been to an ER in 2020, you know that the whole point is to get as many people out of the ER as possible. So as a resident applying to pain medicine, I think these types of blocks will have a lot of utility um, for you in regards to non-operative uh, fractures that you're gonna discharge someone home with you know, PO pain meds. So giving them a block, giving them a prescription, getting them over that initial injury in the hump of that severe pain that occurs at the time of fracture, I think there is a lot of great utilization to be had for using regional anesthesia in the emergency department. I agree, I agree. Um, a couple other questions from the audience. Have you seen prolonged nerve palsy from half percent ropivacaine and brachial plexus blocks? Have you ever diluted it to 0.375 or a quarter percent? Yeah, so I say if you're blocking patients, you've seen prolonged nerve palsies. And so, especially when you're dealing with the brachial plexus, a lot of times you're wondering, is it my block? Was it the surgery? Was it the fixation of the block? And so at any dose of local anesthetic, you are at risk for having some sort of neuropraxic, like a sensory um, prolonged block, hopefully not um, a motor palsy, but it is possible at any dose. There are times that I do dilute to 0.25% um, bupivacaine, um, just in a patient who is smaller, more tenuous as far as you know, the, your ASA three and four patients, um, but also for a block that you're only gonna be using for post-operative pain control and you're not going to be using for surgical anesthesia, it is totally reasonable to dilute down to 0.25%. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think that, you know, you're talking about an anesthetic dose versus an analgesic dose and, and what are the risks associated with both. Um, we have just a couple more and then we'll move on. Um, so talking about PFTs, you mentioned using PFTs to determine if patients would be candidates for interscaling blocks. What is the rationale for PFTs? Yeah, so some, you know, I feel like we always see as, you know, we were all med students, we were all residents and, you know, things that people think anesthesiologists care about, things like chest x-rays and PFTs. And so it is very rare in this day and age. And so although you might see that in textbooks and having people evaluate the FEV1 or the FEC, I just think in reality, especially in a busy private practice, um, that having those types of detailed diagnostic studies readily available to you, especially when you're dealing with acute traumas like fractures, um, just aren't a reasonable um, study to, to look for in determining whether or not you're, you'll, you'll do a block or not. Yeah, and okay, I will move on um, to our supracurricular nerve block and we will circle back to as many of these and then Dr. Holtz will continue to answer questions um, in the chat box on interscalings and clavicle fractures as, as we proceed forward. All right, so the supraclavicular nerve block. So this block is typically um, performed for surgery of the upper limb distal to the shoulder. It has been dubbed this final of the arm because you can get complete anesthesia of the arm and hand with a single nerve block. 
So like the inner scaling block, this block is done with an in-plane technique via ultrasound guidance. The transducer is placed just above the clavicle at its midpoint. And your goal is to see the local anesthetics spread around the brachial plexus, posterior and superficial to the subclavian artery. Again, the total volume local anesthetic for surgical anesthesia and or post-operative pain control is usually 20 to 30 mLs. The risk of phrenic nerve palsy is lower than with the interscaling nerve block, but cannot be reliably avoided. It is imperative to assess the patient's clinical status from a respiratory standpoint when performing a supraclavicular nerve block as well. Um, in patients who can't tolerate even a slight decrease in respiratory function with phrenic nerve block aid, an axillary or infra, um, infraclavicular nerve block is a better choice of anesthesia for the upper extremity. So in order to perform the supraclavicular nerve block, again, the patient is placed in a supine or beach chair position with their face away from the operative side. The transducer is placed just above the clavicle at its midpoint as you look to identify the subclavian artery and the brachial plexus lying posterior lateral and sometimes superficial to the artery. So as shown in the middle picture, I like to tip the transducer caudally as if you're looking underneath the clavicle. Doing this gives the most transverse view of the subclavian artery. The brachial plexus is typically at a depth of one to three centimeters. So the angle of the needle as you puncture the skin will likely be quite shallow. The needle is again inserted lateral to medial as this is the safest route to avoid inadvertent puncture of any vascular structures. Color Doppler is a vital ultrasound feature to use when performing the supraclavicular nerve block. This area of the neck is very vascular and includes some relatively large vessels. As you can see in the bottom picture, the presence of two separate clusters of elements of the brachial plexus, and then they may be more or less obvious, but sometimes they are separated by a blood vessel. So the dorsal scapular artery commonly passes through or within the vicinity of the brachial plexus. When the supraclavicular block is being used for post-operative pain control only, I tend to advance the needle into the corner pocket where the first rib and the subclavian artery meet and inject most of my local anesthetic volume in this location. For speed of block onset and for surgical anesthesia, I typically utilize a two to three injection technique of multiple alphots of local anesthetic, which we will look at next. So at the supraclavicular level, it is important to utilize techniques that minimize injury to the lung or the brachial plexus. So this is achieved by in-plane lateral to medial technique where the entire shaft and needle tip are visualized throughout the entirety of the nerve block. So when using a skin wheel or injection, I like to advance the needle tip less than one centimeter to avoid puncture or injection into the brachial plexus with a sharp high gauge needle. Once you've reached the brachial plexus with your block needle, there are several safe injection techniques that can be utilized. First of which is small volume injections with frequent asp aspiration until you've reached your total volume. So hydro dissection or hydro localization with small injections of local anesthetic as you advance the needle enables you to see where your needle where your local is being placed, but also opens more space for your needle to advance and avoid injection into the brachial plexus itself. As I mentioned, there are several options when it comes to the number of injections to achieve this nerve block. Um, the top picture shows a one injection technique right here into the corner pocket. The second photo shows a two injection technique which is the one I most commonly use when performing supraclavicular nerve blocks for surgical anesthesia. So you have one here to the corner pocket and one right above. The bottom picture shows injection into the connective tissue sheath. So when utilizing this technique that's shown in the bottom picture, 
Many might recommend additional monitoring such as, such as nerve stimulation and or injection pressure to decrease the risk of intrafascicular injection. So now that we have discussed the two major brachial plexus blocks of the arm, we can apply that knowledge to the treatment of another very common fracture that occurs in all age groups, but particularly the elderly, and that is the humerus fracture. The proximal humerus fracture is a common fracture in the elderly after a fall. So the typical demographic of what you should look out for is an elderly female, especially those with osteoporosis. Depending on the displacement level of the fracture, it oftentimes can be treated non-operatively with a sling. If operative fixation is needed, it is important to look at the x-ray image to see if an interscaling or a supraclavicular block would be most beneficial for the patient's post-operative pain control. So similar to the mid-shaft fracture of the clavicle, the shaft the fracture of the humerus is most often an operative fracture in order to restore anatomy more quickly. The picture on the left shows a classic example of a humeral shaft fracture. So this demographic is typically a young patient as a result of a high energy trauma or an elderly osteopenic patient with low energy injury. The determination on whether to block this type of fracture is continually debated amongst and between anesthesiologists and orthopedic surgeons. We will touch on some of the reasons why in just a sec. Um, and then the last type of humeral fracture um, that I will mention is the distal humerus fracture or the supracondylar fracture. So this fracture is uncommon in adults and is seen more often in the pediatric patient population. Fixation of this fracture is deemed more emergent than the other two types of humerus fractures as there can be significant risk for vascular compromise. Um, urgency is usually determined based on how well the hand is perfused at the time of assessment. So there is always a lot of dialogue when it comes to, to the decision on whether to block a humerus fracture. And so what I can tell you is that it is imperative to have open communication with your surgeon so that you are both on the same page when it comes to the clinical concerns of the patient from their standpoint, the goals for your anesthetic and the patient's analgesic needs. Um, Pre-existing nerve um, damage does not preclude a block, but should be documented in as much detail as possible. Open versus closed fractures and the amount of pain that the patient has experienced is, is another consideration when deciding on peripheral nerve blockade. So when discussing the potential for nerve injury, the nerves of concern depend on the location of the fracture. The nerve injuries tend to be nerve praxias, which as a reminder, is just a temporary loss of motor and sensory function due to blockage of nerve conduction and usually lasts an average of six to eight weeks before full recovery. For proximal humerus fractures, the axillary nerve is at risk for injury. Therefore, it is important to determine and document function of the deltoid muscle as well as sensation to the lateral shoulder. And then for supracondylar fractures, the anterior interosseous nerve, which is a branch of the median nerve, is the most common nerve palsy seen. A close second is the radial nerve palsy. And then if you have a flexion type of injury, one can sometimes see an ulnar nerve palsy. Nearly all cases of neuropraxia following supracondylar humerus fractures resolve spontaneously and further diagnostic studies are not indicated in the acute setting. So the next slide, we will look more closely at shaft fractures and the most common peripheral nerve injury associated with long bone fractures you know, of all, which is the radial nerve injury. Right. So radial nerve injury is a common injury of humeral shaft fractures, whether they are closed or open fractures. So as you move down the shaft of the arm, the incidence increases. And you can see in the diagram circled in green is the radial nerve as it traverses through the spiral groove of the humerus. So as mentioned previously, these nerve injuries typically are nerve in nature, especially for closed fractures. 
However, in open fractures, it is not uncommon to see neurotmesis. So neurotmesis is the most severe type of nerve injury and has, has no potential for full recovery on its own. It occurs on severe contusion, stretch, or laceration, and there is complete loss of motor, sensory, and autonomic function. If nerve injury is not present at the time of injury, it can still result postoperatively following operative reduction internal fixation. So when iatrogenic palsies occur, it does tend to improve with observation alone over three months. Um, and that is what the treatment of choice is, even for a radial nerve injury. It can be useful to obtain a nerve conduction study around the two month mark in order to determine the extent of nerve damage, to establish a baseline and to monitor recovery. So I do want to thank you for your time as we have reviewed ultrasound guided regional anesthesia for the upper extremity and the role of x-ray imaging. I would like to leave you with just a few simple take home points that you can think about as you delve back into your upper extremity nerve blocks tomorrow. So interscaling and supraclavicular nerve blocks are the bread and butter of regional anesthesia. And your technique for those should be continually fine tuned throughout your career. Modern day ultrasounds and nerve block needles utilize top of the line technology. Real time visualization of the entire needle is key to achieving adequate nerve blockade and preventing nerve injury. Low volume interscaling blocks may reduce the likelihood of phrenic nerve palsy, but duration of nerve blockade will be sacrificed. X-ray imaging can be extremely helpful in deciding whether to block and what kind of blocks to perform, especially in clavicle and humerus fractures. Pre-existing nerve injury is not an absolute contraindication to nerve block A, but documentation of that is key. And I'd like to invite you all to feel free to reach out to us on Twitter at Kendra Bass MD and at Holtz Maggie. We would be more than happy to continue this conversation with you via social media. And then finally, I would like to just end this by pointing out that today is the only day during the calendar year that gives us a directive, March 4th. So I hope that each of you is able to march forth in your respective roles. Being an anesthesia provider is a tough job, and particularly in the era of COVID-19, some days have been really long. Um, and so just continue to march forth and keep making a difference in your patients' lives. Um, and lastly, if you would like more detailed information on upper extremity nerve blocks, please inquire about receiving free educational posters for your practice by emailing the address on the slide. And so now Dr. Holtz and I will address any um, final questions. Yeah, and so feel free to um, you know, type your questions in that little Q&A box. We do have um, a few questions. There's been a number of questions um, asked about Experl. Uh, you know, liposomal bupivacaine, the long lasting bupivacaine. Um, and do you use it in your practice? How do you use it? What have you seen? And I think perhaps, uh, you know, taking that a step further and talking about just extension of the nerve block in general, what are some other options um, as well to extend the duration of your nerve block? Yeah, so that's a great question. So there are multiple ways to extend your nerve blockade via liposomal bupivacaine, via um, perineural catheters left in place, via adjuvants like decadron, epinephrine, um, clonidine. And so I think it is very reasonable to use any type of um, adjuvant or local anesthetic that will extend your patient's um, recovery, uh, post-operative recovery, and give them pain control for 48 hours or more. Yeah, and I agree with that. I think that it's important to look at the expected pain duration burden of your patient. So if you're talking about a small you know, surgery, not painful, your pain duration might be dealt with with a simple single shot block. If you're talking about a, a total shoulder or a rotator cuff you know, procedure, 
that's going to be a more extended duration of expected pain. And so I think that um, as regional anesthesiologists, we have to match our techniques with that burden of pain. And so again, ways to do that are things like Exbrol, adjuvants, catheters. Um, and I think that that really helps with the patient satisfaction. So we, we use all of them in our practice, to be honest with you. Um, okay, so we have another question. Um, so you spoke about your technique uh, for brachial plexus blocks and you seem to advocate for the perineural approach. Uh, yet this sort of perineural versus intraneural injection discussion still seems to be a debate in the regional anesthesia community. Can you talk a little bit more about your preference and why you decide to use this? Yeah, so as you can you know, you heard from my presentation, you know, I'm all about mitigating your risk as much as possible, especially when you're working at high volume ambulatory surgery centers or orthopedic specific hospitals, you are going to do a lot of blocks over the course of a year. And so anything that I can personally do to minimize um, encountering a patient that's going to have um, risk for nerve injury or prolonged nerve palsy, and so I have found that injecting alongside the nerve roots has allowed me to get adequate block um, onset for surgical anesthesia and the amount of time that I need versus doing more risky techniques such as you know, trying to place the needle between nerve roots or even, um, as you mentioned, intraneural. And so I would you know, love to hear as well if you know, your technique on that. Yeah, and, and my technique has changed. And I think that that's the, the beauty of regional anesthesia is, is that you do tweak your technique over time and as new studies and uh, you know come to light. I used to do the intraneural technique. That's just what I was taught. That's what I always did. And then some you know recent more histolo histological type studies have come out that have given me a little bit of pause. And so I, I do exactly what you do. I stay perineural. I think that um, you're still going to get a good block you might sacrifice a few minutes of onset time. I'm never doing a stat interscaling block, so I'd rather wait a few extra minutes for that block to set up um, rather than potentially causing nerve injury. And I really liked how you identified the fact that C6 is often split. These are very raw nerve roots in that area. You know, we're we're not seeing the, the classic superior, middle, inferior chunk that we were taught in medical school. We're seeing more proximal, we're seeing the roots. And um, you know they're they're quite raw at that place, and I I, I like that between C five and C six there tends to be a little extra bit of tissue, and it's a little sort of w extra wiggle room, and so that's kind of where I aim my needle, um, but I stay perineural. I don't aim to get into that plexus, and and it's uh, it's sufficient for the block as well. So I I completely agree with you. Um, we have another great question here. How frequently do you use a nerve stimulator approach alone versus an ultrasound guided approach or a combined? So ultrasound plus nerve stimulator. Yeah, so um, I typically, I would probably say I never use nerve stimulator alone at this point. So every block that I do is via ultrasound guidance. I will say that there are times where a patient has anatomy that is a little bit confusing or, um, or, or something that looks apparent, or you know, if I have a very obese patient and I'm not um, really able to identify the, the, the nerve specifically, I'll add the nerve stimulator um, to my technique, um, but it, is, it would be very rare or that I would use nerve stimulator alone. Yeah, so and I basically for for me for subpar imaging mm -hmm. that's when I pull out my um, nerve stimulator. Yeah, and, and I agree, and I think you know ultrasound is is sort of becoming the standard of care. Um, although I don't think there's anything you know wrong with adding the nerve stimulator for just confirmation that you're, you're there. And also, as you talked about, um, you know that that pressure and making sure that you're not intraneural. Um, you know, before you inject. So I think it gives you that little extra bit of information um, and little extra safety margin as well. But yeah, I, I don't think any of us, you know, routinely use nerve stimulation alone. It's always, if we're using it, it's co in combination with ultrasound guidance. 
Yeah, I would love if we were using injection pressures just because I'm the type of person that likes to see numbers and likes data. And so knowing the actual PSI of your opening injection pressure, um, I think would be useful and also um, just give you a lot of information, especially if you're in a practice that has learners. Um, but I find it's rare to find a practice that is using um, injection pressure monitoring regularly. I don't know if you've had any experience with that. Yeah, no, we, we don't routinely use it. We probably should. It's one of those, you know, should be doing it. We don't routinely do it. I think that one of the problems with the injection pressure monitor is you're you're trying to look at that, you're trying to look at the ultrasound, you're trying to look at your needle. And once you kind of hit above that 15 PSI, is that already too late? Um, you know, so, so, you know, there's a debate on that, of course, but it's something that it, again, all of those tools add that another layer of safety. What I will say is that having a dedicated um, block team or a block nurse um, that regularly does your injections for you or um, doing your own injection for your nerve blocks can also establish a measure of safety for practices like ours that don't have injection pressure monitoring. So I often tell, um, especially back in, when I was in academics that the person injecting the local anesthetic is just as important or more important than the person holding the needle. And so you can get a lot of information and feedback um, depending on the um, volume syringe you're using, a 10cc or 20cc, or if you have someone new, a new block nurse who doesn't know what it should or shouldn't feel like. And so given that feedback to the injector saying, oh, I'm having high resistance. You know, if you see someone two handing the, the syringe, you know that it should not require that amount of um, injection pressure. And so, you know, really formulating a system where you have set it up to, to have as much safety as possible based on what you have at your disposal you know, in your practice. Exactly. So I think we have time for maybe one more question. Uh, we have one uh, about the, the volume of local anesthetics. So, you know, you said you use typically between 20 and 30 cc's of local anesthetic for brachial plexus blocks. Are you commonly using volumes as high or commonly using lower volume blocks? Yeah, so I am definitely using 20 to 30 ml. So, you know, I'm in North Carolina and the patients are large. <laughs> and so it would be uncommon for me to use a low volume technique unless I am specifically concerned um, about something in regards to that specific patient. And so if I'm using a block for surgical anesthesia, I will use about 25 to 30 mLs because I also want them to have great post-operative pain control. And so, you know, one of the studies that I mentioned that use lower volumes around eight to nine mLs of local anesthetic, although that was good enough to get through the surgery, that block is wearing off um, very quickly around the eight hour range. And I would gander that most people on this webinar, when you're consenting your patient for a nerve block, you are telling them that it is going to last much longer than eight hours. And so, um, yes, that, that, that's the volume I'm using. Great. Um, so we're just about out of time, but just again, feel free. If we didn't answer your question, we still want to get to it. Um, so please message us on Twitter. We gave you our handles. Um, we're more than happy to answer any and all questions that you do have because they're all important. Um, and then don't forget about those free posters from Pam. They are, they're amazing. We have them up in our block room. We get the new ones every time they make them, um, but they're really great references and resources. Even our patients look at them. They're like, oh, those are pretty cool. So um, we really appreciate everybody joining us tonight, your attention, your participation. Uh, we hope you enjoyed this webinar as much as we did. And it's been about a full year now of virtual meetings. And now with the, the vaccine out and hope on the horizon, we, um, while it is nice to be wearing pajama pants um, doing a webinar, uh, we do hope to see you all in person soon. So stay well, everybody, and good night.